Rome today, the, the city of Rome, and uh, we'll be looking at uh, Ephesus, or uh, uh, as the, the Lord had intended this letter to go to. Men's prayer guys on Saturday, uh, ongoing every Saturday morning here at 7.30 at the chapel. We encourage you guys to come on and uh, join us. The fellowship is always great, the coffee's on, and just a tremendous time as we enjoy uh, uh, the worship uh, and prayer uh, to the Lord. So again, a great opportunity. 7.30, we get out right at 8.30, and uh, you have the rest of the Saturday free. So again, coming up for that, always a great time. We're going to continue uh, in our study through the New Testament in the book of Ephesians this morning. If you'd like to turn to Ephesians chapter 1, we're actually going to be referring back to Acts chapter 28 also. But uh, uh, we will be in Ephesians chapter 1. And Father God, again, we want to thank you for this morning, Lord. We thank you for the many blessings you have for each and every one of us, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for those who are here, Lord, and we even pray for those who aren't here, Lord, who haven't made it this morning for one reason or the other, Lord. We pray, Lord God, that as you minister to us, you might be ministering to their hearts, to, to each and every one of their hearts, and uh, wherever they may be, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We pray for your faithfulness and love, Lord. Now open up our hearts and minds to the study of your word. In Jesus' name we pray, Lord. Amen. Amen. We left off last Sunday, really, in Acts chapter 28, guys, and that Paul had, that had entered the city of Rome. We were told that Paul stayed in the rented accommodations for some two years. Visit, visitors uh, frequently came and went uh, without much restriction. No, Paul had that, uh, that wonderful thing that he was a, he was a Roman citizen, a citizen. They extend him a lot of courtesy, and you know, although there may have been a guard surrounding him and uh, in and around his house, he could freely receive visitors, and there was some, you know, some type of freedom and courtesy. I believe God had extended him just a lot of grace, even in his imprisonment. Uh, things went were, you know, going pretty well for him. The preaching and the teaching of the gospel message went on unhindered, and you know, uh, Paul freely ministered. You know, even the guards around him they heard the word, the good news of Jesus Christ. He shared in one of his letters, the whole Praetorian Guard has heard the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And I believe that wherever he went, his life uh, was a good impact for the love of Jesus Christ. We did mention that, however, that as Paul sailed on the final leg of his voyage into Rome on that Alexandrian ship, apparently, you know, approaching his final destination, there must have been some question. You know, he's only a human. We think that Paul is a superhuman guy. But, you know, as he was approaching his final destination, there must have been some question. There must have been some doubt of where he was, you know, where he was going, what lay before him. And, you know, this is really in that last section of Acts chapter 28, uh, the last few verses. Some doubt, you know, of what lay before him. And, you know, life is like that. The uncertainty of his own future and for us. You know, what lies in front of us at times becomes a big question. Hey, what, what, what lies around the corner? What goes in the future? What's happening? And you know, a, a lot of times we can be worrisome, we can be fearful, but you know, we can't really worry about what we cannot control. Sometimes things are just out of our circumstance. And you know, he must have been committing these things to the Lord. But you know, again, uh, his own personal well-being, some question of what lay before him. Much of the things that you might know, believe that Paul felt is what we feel too. And what's in front of us? What's going to, uh, what's, uh, what's the coming future going to do? Even this fearless brother in the Lord, Lord, always bold, always pressing forward, may have lapsed into some trepidation. You know, I'm not sure, but like ourselves, we have our moments. And you know, it's the weakness of the flesh. It's the nature of the flesh that a lot of times we worry. And you know, there's. There's things that we don't know about what, what, what goes on on the unknown and so on. But we saw again in Acts 28, some brothers came a fairly far distance to greet the apostle. We believe that, you know, some 40, 50 miles away, these guys made a journey. And we're told in verse 15 of Acts 28 that Paul saw them. He thanked God 
and he took courage. And we delivered this, this fact that, you know, as Paul saw them, you know, it, it became a point, point of faith. It was a real release of faith, like, wow, God, you're working. God, you moving. Lord, look at these beautiful guys coming to just spend some time with me. There, again, he, he just broke into a, a, a heart filled with even greater thanksgiving. He thanked God. And number three, we saw in verse 15 that he took courage. And lots of times we think that Paul, you know, as he was on that last leg of the voyage, on that ship that got all busted up and, and, and got shipwrecked on the island of Malta, uh, you know, he, he was the one always encouraging the sailors, the mariners, those upon the ship, take courage, take courage, because the Lord is with us. There's not going to be any loss of life. We're going to lose the ship. We're going to lose all of the cargo and the contents, but we're going to come through with our lives. He encouraged the guys. He encouraged the guys time and time again. But now it was time for the Lord to encourage Paul. And as, as, uh, as we commented, that that's why we have that one another fellowship, that as he saw them, he thanked God, and he himself took courage. He himself was encouraged. And that's why we need one another. That's why we need to gather. That's why, you know, I, I laugh about it. I say Saturday morning prayer. We hee-haw around. Sometimes we talk about the craziest subjects and, you know, the greatest things come into play. But we, we really enjoy it. And then we just get on into the prayer. And then, you, know, you know, but it's a time that we can just kind of let our hair down, be uh, 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 unhindered in fellowship. And just say, hey, this is what's going on. He saw them. He, he thank God he took courage. And again, you know, the brothers need one another to, uh, in, in, again, encourage this, uh, these things. But Paul's possible uneasiness was well-founded as he was entering the greatest city in the world. Their Rome was uh, the population estimates range from between one and four million people at this time. You know, uh, more conservative, F S conservative estimates, one million. Some estimates up to four, over four million people. By comparison, New York City, all the five boroughs, guys, is 8.1 million. So it's a huge city. Los Angeles, California, 3.7 million people. So if, if Rome indeed had four million people, it was like the size of LA, the city of LA. San Diego, California, 1.3 million. And you think, hey, San Diego is a huge place, but Rome was a huge city. So when you think that even if it was only one point something million, it's a huge, huge place. But the city, uh, or the city known as the City on Seven Hills was famous for its roads and scenic avenues that would, uh, uh, that wound among the hills and the Tiber River that went up, uh, came alongside the city. Throughout the city were many gardens and parks and the Forum, a city center, in which were the government buildings as well as palaces and many exquisite temples and altars were arrayed. Guys, this must have been a fabulous city. We're going to look at the city of Ephesus. Ephesus was uh, was unreal. The, 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 the actual roads were paved with marble. And that must have been such a huge grand grand promenade. But the city of Rome must have been much like that. The city center was uh, where, again, all the business took place as well as the, the leaders, the palaces. It's kind of like, you know, uh, kind of like going down King Street where you have the royal palace on one side, the statue of Kamehameha on the other side, Hanulu Hale and then Kwai Lao Church, kind of like that, you know. Uh, it was must have been very, very magnificent. And I think, you know, multiplied many times over. But uh, 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 the temple of Apollo was there as well as Jupiter, the temple of Saturn, and the temple of the divine Julius, you know, they worshipped the, the emperor. They thought he was God. And you know, like like uh, like many others, you know, they uh, they worshipped the emperor in Japan. They worshipped uh, guys like Hitler as God. You know, these people. And the same thing with this emperor worship in Rome. And it kind of tells you where the heart of the people was at. They worship all these pagan gods. They worship all these guys like Jupiter and Zeus and so on. They thought that their emperor was God himself. But the Roman legacy to the world was, was road building. They had good roads. They built aqueducts. In other words, they had a lot of water flowing through the city. They had fresh water flowing through the city. They had plumbing. They had heating. They had public baths. You know, uh, I, I don't know if that was uh, like a funeral bath or whatever it was, but they had these baths where they, the guys would go and take a bath. So hygiene was important. Water works were important. Um, 
They also took from the Greek games, guys, and added to the Roman spectator sports and contests. The Greek spectator sports and contests, guys. The, the, uh, the Rome of Paul's time was given to pleasure. The Rome of Paul's time was given to pleasure. Bread and circuses were the concern of the population. Get that, bread and circus. Uh, holidays number 159 holidays a year. Wow, can you imagine that? <laughs> imagine the, the holiday pay in uh, Florida to pay. Well, more than half the people were slaves, so you know, there was no extra thing, but they did give them holidays. 159 holidays, and 93 were supplied by the government. In other words, the government sponsored 93 holidays. Sounds like our state government. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, Bible historian Merrill Unger speaks of this bread and circus, which spoke of bread. Well, take it a step further, guys, for beer and entertainment. All the ingredients of bread making are the same ingredients that it, that goes into the making of beer. And given given the process of fermentation, give the people what they want. Give them full stomachs, entertainment, a lot of a little beer, a little wine, and we'll have the population under control. It's kind of, it's almost like we are today. Guys, uh, as we commented before, you look at the big ad on Sunday mornings, and I was counting the pages last Sunday, oh, four pages of beer, alcohol, and hard liquor uh, in the ad. Today I opened the same ad, I said, oh, okay, only two pages. Maybe it's Mother's Day, so they kind of light <laughs> on the alcohol ads. And I was thinking, wow, you know, this alcohol. But uh, uh, give the people what they want, full Starbucks, entertainment and a little bit of brewski and we'll have them under control and it's, it's just like that today give them, give them what they want give them the entertainment and we'll collect the taxes we'll get them to work things will roll around the circus maximus uh, uh, theater sat some 200,000 people and uh was this was also among the circuses of caligula and nero along with others Theaters that sat tens of thousands also dotted the landscape. So they were big into plays, they were big into the, the gladiators. But uh, as, as Rome degenerated, guys, much of the quote unquote entertainment turned into bloody spectacles and orgies. And you kind of think that if they had the, the, the uh, gladiators battling one another, they got into these things that we call them blood sports today, where guys were bloody, guys were killed, guys were maimed. And people were entertained with this brutality. I mean, where do you draw the line, you know? And, uh, and, and, and much of that is like that, you know, for us today. We, we like that. We watch the MMA. We watch this. We watch that, you know. And it becomes a kind of a brutality, a brutal kind of sport, yeah. But again, uh, you call those the blood sports, and uh, uh, these were taking place. The vast majority of the people of Rome were slaves, guys. And, and, and uh, they were at the mercy of their rulers. You know, sometimes the slaves were treated well, sometimes the slaves were like family. Sometimes the slaves even became friends. It's like the, the, the writer of the book of Luke and the book of Acts. He was a, thought to be a doctor, a physician, who may have been set free. He was a slave who may have been set free by his owners because, because of the love and because maybe they were Christians. I don't know, but they say, go and uh, take care of Paul. Uh, write to us letters of what's going on in the ministry, they, they very well may have been Christians because the letters are addressed, most excellent Theophilus, most, most excellent lover of God. This is what I have to report to you. And you know, the, the book of Acts was written. Uh, this is the thing that's ongoing with the church. Um, but this is the world of both opulence and squalor that Paul entered. Can you imagine this? Much of the, people, the poor people of Rome they lived in these multi-level, almost apartment buildings, guys. Multi-level apartment buildings. They were called tenements. And that's where you get that old term. You might have heard of that. that oh, 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 and he lived in a tenement building down, down in Palama by across from uh, Tamashiro Market. There's a tenement building. And I remember that. You know, it's like a three-story walk-off, all wooden. And I remember, oh, yeah, the aunties all you know, lived over there at the time, too. These tenement buildings, well, that's what they call them back then. Tenement buildings, that word, that's where we get the term. But as we turn the page from Acts 28, 16 to 31, guys, we, we, we now open the page to the first of the series of letters known as the prison epistles. 
is thought that Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, and Philemon were written during Paul's first Roman imprisonment in AD 60 to 62, somewhere in that area, guys. Key words in the book of, uh, in the letter to the church of Ephesus is the, the word, uh, 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 Key words or words in this message of good news and the grace of God is the word in, I am, in. And um, uh, it's used some 90 times. It stresses the believer's union with Christ. And take it a step further, the phrase in Christ or uh, derivatives thereof appear some 35 times in this short little letter, in Christ. You can, uh, you can read through and, and read ahead and make mental notes or checks as you come across this phrase in Christ or in the Lord. Uh, verses 1 to 2, Ephesians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll see in this letter, uh, in, in his letters, Paul frequently opens with a salutation that identifies him as the letter writers to the recipients, right up front he says, hey, it's me, it's Paul, uh, and blah, blah, blah. Paul, he identifies himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. And this word apostle is simply translated as men divinely commissioned to represent Christ. Men divinely uh, commissioned to represent uh, uh, Christ. And these guys were raised up early on in the ministry, walking alongside Jesus Christ and ministering with him. And they were divinely commissioned again to be representative of Jesus Christ and the gospel message. Paul says, I am one divinely appointed to represent the Lord. And this is according to the will of God. He says, hey, I'm not out of the will of God. I'm try not trying to do my own will. But, you know, here I am. I am I'm divinely appointed. And this is according to the will of God. And you may kind of think at times, yeah, I mean, I, am I walking in the will of God? Am I moving in the will of God? Am I where the will of God has me? You know, doing these things and following after what, you know, he's leading. And uh, you, you, you kind of want to do a self-check and ask God, hey, I, I hope I'm in your will. I will be done in your will. You know, am I in your will? But he's, he addresses this to the saints and the faithful in Ephesus. And you know, that word saint is, is just the same word as holy, set apart. And it really means you're a holy guy. You're a holy guy in Christ Jesus. Yeah, you want to say that you're a holy roller, that's it. But that word saint or the word holy is simply mean those who are set apart for Christ Jesus and are faithful. You who are faithful. And it's almost like a title or a, a, a nickname. You guys are faithful. And again, a descriptive of what your actions are. You're faithful in the Lord Jesus Christ. This... Uh, he goes on in verse 2, uh, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, you know, some have coined this as the Siamese twins of the New Testament. Grace or charis uh, in the Greek is a word that may convey the thought of favorable regard or pleasure and delight. It may speak of friendly disposition, a kind act that, uh, uh, that precedes graciousness, loving kindness, and generally goodwill. It speaks of the goodwill. He says, hey, grace and peace to you. It speaks of, uh, uh, of grace and loving kindness and generally goodwill. Speaking of God's grace, it's, it's, uh, it's redemptive mercy, God's redemptive mercy for the life of the believer and the pleasure or joy he designs for the recipient. Can you believe that? God, when he says, hey, grace to you, uh, Ron, grace to you, Domenico, what he really means is that hey, you might know my redemptive mercy and the pleasure and the joy that he has for, for, for the recipients. You and I, we're the recipients of that joy. And, and the pleasure it gives him uh, that, 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 that we would receive all that he has. Uh, the, that's the Greek side of the, the, the coin, but peace may speak of the harmonized relationship between God and man. You kind of think that, why don't I have any peace? It's because we might be fighting against God. You know, it's like Paul, on the, uh, when Saul was on the Damascus road, God said to him, Saul, Saul, why do you kick against the goads? It's like the, the, the sharp uh, points of these goads were kind of pointing him towards the Lord. And then he was fighting against that. He was kicking against that. And in that, he was really kicking these sharp pointed sticks and hurting himself. 
And you know, it, it, and much of the time when we run from God, we are hurting ourselves. Much of the time we just have no peace, we have no rest, we have no real joy. We might be happy, happy one day, sad the next, up and down, up and down. Yo yo this, yo yo that. But the, the, this uh, peace speaks of the, the, the speak is the peace, peace is accomplished through the gospel and the sense of rest and contentment, guys. It is the consequence thereof uh, of that relationship, that harmonized relationship with God. The Hebrew word shalom primarily signifies wholeness. Can you think that if we were whole? Or before we have the peace of God, we were broken. You know, we were broken into pieces. We were missing pieces. But it signifies wholeness or, or, or full, made perfect. Do you think that I'm full of the love of God? I'm full of His peace. I'm full of His rest. And sometimes you, you think Christians, they look kind of like they're full and they're plump and they're joyful. But you don't know what it is. It's the fullness of the Holy Spirit. It's the fullness of God's love for them that gives them that that, that glow about them or that look about them that says, hey, this guy looks pretty restful, you know. Uh, but it, 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 the word, the associated words with perfect or full is finished or salvation. How do you like that? Shalom says, it's salvation to you, saving grace to you. Hence in the New Testament, he's the God of peace or the Lord of peace. He's described of that throughout the New Testament as the God of peace the Lord of Peace. So you think that the, the common uh, uh, the common language then back then was Koine Greek, common Greek. So he greets the people in Greek and he greets the people in Hebrew. Uh, he's greeting both the, the Jew and the Gentile, saying grace and peace. He's reaching out to all mankind, grace and peace in the love of Jesus Christ. Beautiful is this greeting from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. But this letter is addressed to the church in Ephesus which was the major church in this area called Asia Minor. It's, today it's called Turkey. Uh, and, uh, but the church in Ephesus was a large church. We remember in, in Acts chapter 19 and 20, I believe, Paul spent about three years with the church in Ephesus, establishing the church. John, the apostle John, would eventually go on to live his life out at the church in Ephesus, I think after his release from the island of Patmos. Uh, where he was, you know, thrown in, in prison there, on, uh, in hard labor there. But this letter to the church uh, reminds believers that it, they are rich far beyond what they could think or imagine. You know, sometimes we think we, we just paupers, we're living spiritually poor, spiritually bereft of any of the benefits. But what's, what's on tap for us, guys, are riches far beyond what we could think or imagine in Christ Jesus. And don't get me wrong, I'm not one of those... Uh, uh, what, what do you call them, the, uh, the ones that believe in money and so on and so forth. But you know, money is good, but you know, some guys, they, they believe that the gospel is equating with things financial, not so. But it speaks of the f spiritual fullness in Christ, guys. Uh, this is the reminder that there is wealth of spiritual blessings beyond measure. In these first few chapters, it's Paul's reminder uh, to the believers that they have a heavenly trust account that we can draw on. We have a heavenly bank account that we can draw upon. Here in, uh, in chapter 1, verses 3 to 6, let's read 3 to 6. <coughs> Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him, in love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. We are blessed by God the Father, guys. You know, blessed be the God and Father of our, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. In other words, we have the picture of the Father in heaven who desires to bless us, his kids, guys, with all the spiritual blessings that are, are, are due us, uh, are available for us, of in and through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He has blessed us, blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Can you see that realm that God is sitting in, in heaven? You know, the psalmist says that, uh, 
we, we were at a, a memorial service a few weeks back and the, the, the nephew of one of the, of the, the guy who went to be with the Lord quoted Psalm 33, where it says, he simply started off, God sees all men from heaven and he knows their hearts. And I thought, wow, that's such a beautiful verse, you know, beautiful series of verses in that song. And I told him after, I went up after the service and I shook his hand and I, I shook his sister's hand and said, I just love the verses that you guys shared about uh, at, your, at your uncle's service on behalf of your uncle today. But you know, it, it really reminds us that God sees us from heaven and his desire was to bless us uh, with all the spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. And that's why God came revealed as a man God come in the flesh, born of a virgin, to to, uh, to live and to walk this earth and to preach the good news of, of Christ and his salvation, and then be crucified and rise again on the third day. But just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. And God, for all time, he, he knew us. He knew, uh, he knew, uh, uh, he knew us. And, 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 and he says that we were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. And guys would say, hey, how come, how come I'm the unlucky guy? I don't think God chose me. And all you got to do is tell him, hey, just say yes to him and then you'll know that you're chosen by him. But really what I believe is all mankind are chosen. All we got to do is receive the gift that he has for us. All of our names are in the Lamb's Book of Life. And we're going to work pretty darn hard to get our names erased out of that book. Because it's right there for us. All we're going to do is say yes to it. And yes to Jesus. Yes, I want that life. I want that grace. I want that mercy. I want that forgiveness. I want the hope of, uh, of all eternity with you. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Christ Jesus to himself, according to the kind intention of his world. Isn't that a, such a blessing? Do you think that we have a God in heaven and his, his intentions are good, his intentions are kind, his intentions are, uh, my, I have a little footnote in my Bible that, that, that the word kind can also be translated. It was his good pleasure that we would be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. See, we were, we were born outside of the family of God, but now we were adopted not as, as slaves, we're taken not as friends, not as a, uh, this or that, but he took us into our home, and he took us into our home, uh, into his home, and we were adopted. We have all the blessings, all the benefits as a natural born child, but now he has adopted us through Jesus Christ according to the good pleasure, the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. The beloved is who? The, the, the beloved is Jesus Christ, guys. He's, a, he's the beloved, and he freely restored his grace upon us to the praise of his glory. To the praise of his glory, guys. Verses 7 through 12. In him we have redemption through the, uh, his blood and the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the kind, uh, uh, made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention which he purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of times that is the summing up of all things in Christ things in the heavens and things upon the earth uh, uh, and uh, here it is guys in him uh, in him in Christ guys we have redemption through his blood in other words we just have gone through that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, his death on the cross. We just celebrated our communion Sunday uh, last week or the week before where we said hey, we were reminded of your blood shed for us, your blood that washes us and cleanses us, your blood uh, that was sacrificed on our behalf and uh, that blood that was drawn for us. And in that we have the uh, forgiveness of our trespasses. And that's a nice way to say that hey, we have forgiveness of sins. Because we don't like that word sin, and we got to just realize that we are literally sinners saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. And, uh, um, and, and it's according to the riches of His grace. What is that grace again? It's that favorable thought, that favorable comment that He has for us, that, uh, that, 
that that word that speaks of God's redemptive mercy and the pleasure and joy He designs for us is by that grace, guys. Verse eight says, "He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight." And you know, uh, when you kind of think that lavish is such a uh, a great word, yeah, can you think that oh, they were so lavish? We went to this uh, this party. We went to this house. And they lavished upon us all this comfort, all their goodness, all their great things. And it's kind of like you go into the home of a rich person where they're just lavishing upon you the gifts and all the good things, all the food. And God, had, He owns all the cattle on a thousand hills, guys. And how do you think that God would just love to lavish upon us uh, all the great things that He has on our behalf? He, he lavished all the riches of His grace. And in all his wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to the kind intention which he purposed in him. He purposed in Christ uh, that he, we would know the kind intention of his will. He made known to us the mystery of his will. And this word mystery is the Greek word mysterion, and it's where we get the word mystery, mystery novel. You know, it's, 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 it's a direct translation, but it's not a mis like a mystery novel. This word mystery in the Greek is translated can be made known only by divine revelation. In other words, it's only by God's divine revelation that he has made known to us the mystery of his world according to the kind intention, his kind intentions for us, which he purposed in Christ Jesus. He's made them known, he's making them known to us according to the kind intention of his world. And with an administration suitable to the fullness of times, that is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in heavens and uh, things upon the earth in Him. I think that King James uses the term the manifold. Hi, good morning, guys. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Read Ephesians chapter 1 if you got your Bibles. Ephesians chapter 1. We're looking at the Son. We just looked at the Father. We're looking at the Son now. And with a with a view to an administration, administration suitable to the fullness of time, that is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things upon the earth. This word "summing up," guys, really. Uh, uh, well, first of all, he speaks of that administration suitable to the fullness of times. In other words, what 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 is uh, what is the Lord trying to tell us? The time is right. The time is. It's like a woman in labor ready to give birth. There's no holding back the coming baby. And what uh, what what uh, the writer is saying that there's a time coming and we're just rapidly approaching the time if we're not already the time, that in this fullness of time, things are gonna be coming down, things are gonna be happening, we're gonna see. And we've heard of the return of Jesus Christ, we've heard of the catching up of the church, and we I believe we're right in the cusp of that. I think that, you know, as we live in these times and days, as we can see the signs of the time, we know that the time is right, that the time is pretty full, and, you know, the, 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 the day of the Lord is at hand. It's a reckoning of all things. The, the, that word summing up that you might have in your Bible, um, the view to the administration, that the summing up of all things in Christ, really it's a word of accounting, guys. It's a word of accounting. And it really says that the day of reckoning is coming. You might think of it as a, a, an order of vernacular or an order word. The summing up of all things says that there's a day of reckoning coming. For the believer, there is no more judgment. Our judgment was taken upon the body of Jesus Christ as he went to the cross for us. But uh, it is done. It is complete. You know, the work of God is complete as he came to redeem all of mankind. And as we've humbled ourselves and come to him and said that, hey, Lord, I need everything that you have for me. I need the forgiveness of sin. I need the washing. I need the cleansing. I know I need the hope everlasting. Uh, we can see that we are redeemed by the Son. And again, uh, in verse 9, he said, This is the mystery of his will, a divine revelation uh, that he purposed in him in Christ Jesus. And you know, he's letting us know that there's a day coming, a day of reckoning. There's a day coming. And you know, we, we, we might be around for the catching away of the church, we might be around for that, but at times, believers do die, believers do uh, 
we go home to be with the Lord at an early age. And sometimes we think it's so premature. Sometimes we think that it's so unfair. Sometimes we think that, oh, the guy was doing so good. He should have a longer life. But at times, you know, God just takes them home. I, I always go back to the book of Genesis. I always go back to Enoch. Enoch was a good guy. Enoch knew God. Enoch walked with God. And Enoch was, but Enoch was not, you know, for God to him. And, you know, God, as Enoch was walking with the Lord, one day he went off for that walk with the Lord, and God took him home straight home. And sometimes that's, a, that's what it's like for the believer. We just don't know that day, that time, that hour. And sometimes God, uh, God calls us home at various times and different times. And again, uh, it's that time where uh, that day of reckoning for the believer, again, our, our, our account is paid for, you know. Uh, what does the accuser of the brethren say in the book of Revelation? He's accusing you and I before the throne of God, the devil. And, and uh, what does the, 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 uh, the intercessor say? Father, these are mine. These are mine. The Lord Jesus Christ saying, I'm speaking on our behalf. These are mine. There's no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, if you haven't received the Lord, uh, you know, I would say, hey, get right with the Lord. If you're kind of playing the footsies with the Lord and kind of half in, half out, kind of half warm, half cold, and lukewarm, you know, he spoke to the church in Revelation, one of the churches, and says, hey, I, 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 I don't like you because I spew you out of my mouth. You're neither hot nor cold. And, and he says, hey, get serious is the warning there in, in uh, Revelation as he writes to the churches. But that, that summing up of things is coming down. In him also, verse 11, we have obtained an inheritance, having been pre predestined according to the purpose uh, who works all things after the counsel of his will. And God is working all again his things, the counsel of his will. Remember in verse, uh, in, uh, uh, verse, uh, verse 1, Paul identified himself as the apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. And God is working and, uh, and willing His purpose for you and I, guys. And in, in this, He says that He's working all things after the counsel of His will. And you know, we, we kind of think that, hey, God, would you will something easier? Will you will something better? Will you will something that there's not too much pain or suffering or hard labor and sweat and this and that? Oh, Lord, why are you willing that? Can I hit the lottery? You know, I always go back to the lottery uh, thinking that, hey, money is the answer. No, it's not. The answer really is only in the peace of God, the peace that passes all understanding. Remember, He's the God of peace. He's the Lord of peace in the Old Testament. And, and peace is that speaks of that harmonized relationship between God and man. You know, one time we were enemies of God. You know, we were running, we were fighting, we were doing everything we could uh, against God. And we were blaspheming His name and this and that. And we would use His name as a curse word. And, all that and, and, and God says, hey, this is me. I'm, I'm reaching out to you and I, I need to for you to see here, right here in these verses, these short few verses, guys, in chapter 1, verses 3 to 14, we have a clear picture of God the Father and His plans for us. God the Son is redemption uh, by His blood and we are now sealed in the Holy Spirit. We're coming up to that portion in verse 13, uh, but uh, uh, but in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose who works all things after the counsel of his will. In other words, we're not hired hands, we're not slaves who are friendly towards our master, but now we are children of the God most high. And now, be, being that we are children, we are entitled, we have entitlements, we are entitled to all the fullness of his blessings, to all the fullness of the eternal uh, promises that he has for us, guys. And we have obtained that inheritance. Remember we spoke that uh, the people in Ephesus might have been living as proper spiritual paupers because they didn't realize they had all of God's uh, blessings available for them. All the fullness of joy, all the promises were not only for the Jew, but for the Gentile. And we will see in the book of Ephesians that he's uh, made the two into one. There's no more difference between Jew and Gentile. God sees us all as one mankind. But in, uh, in verse, uh, 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 verse 12, he says, To the end, we were with the first to hope of Christ should be to the praise of His glory. Look, note again, here's the term, to the praise of His glory. 
uh, it seems that at each juncture of this portion of scripture, he ends that portion of the scripture to the praise of the glory of his grace, or the, to the praise of his glory. In verse 13, in him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you are sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Here now we look at these two verses, is the working and the, 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 the position of the Spirit of God in our hearts and lives. In him, who's in him, guys? In Christ. You also, after listening to the message of truth, the good news of your salvation, having also believed, you are sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Sometimes in these old movies, you see these guys, uh, they, they're writing a letter, and they put the letter in the envelope, they, they take a, their lighted candle, and they drip the wax onto the, uh, the flap of the letter, because I guess they didn't have a uh, they didn't have glue back then, or it wasn't uh, self-sticking, self-sealing envelopes. But they, they, they dropped that wax on them. Then they put their little signet ring or their little seal on that wax, saying that I sealed this. This is my transmittal, this is my letter to you. Look at my identifying mark. And this, is, this you know comes from me. This is from my, this is mine. <coughs> It's the same thing like containerized cargo coming in down at the pier of the waterfront. All the, all the doors are sealed with a mark that's cut off only at the opening of that container. This says that this was sealed at the port of exit, at the point of exit, at the shipper's point. This is our merchandise. And now when you cut that seal off, uh, that identifying seal, it becomes uh, yours. You know that it came from us. You know because the manifest says what's in that what's in that container. Um, and uh, again, you are sealed now after listening to the gospel of salvation. Having also believed, you are sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise. The Holy Spirit is given as a promise, guys. We are sealed in Him. We are that word sealed says we are marked by the uh, by the the sealing, the marking of the Holy Spirit by the love of Jesus Christ. Somehow the different look that we have, it says that in your seal, you are marked with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of promise was given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of His glory. Uh, that word pledge, guys, is in, is in the Greek engagement ring. So, so some of you ladies, if you did get an engagement ring back then, uh, that engagement ring, what, did that, what that, did, did that mean? It meant that your fiancé, your, your, uh, your guy was going to come back for you and marry you. This is saying, I promise you, with this engagement ring, that I'm coming back to marry you. And things were a little bit, uh, you know, border fashion back then. You had an engagement ring, you had a wedding ring. And if you've been to some bad weddings, you hear the, the MC say, now you have the suffering. <laughs> That's so, but the engagement ring, the wedding ring, ring, <laughs> and the supper. <laughs> you don't throw any rotten tomatoes at me, okay? <laughs> but the, the, the engagement ring says, yeah, I'm promising, you're the bride of Christ, and I'm the bride whom I'm promising that I'm coming to return for you one day. And that, that pledge of the Holy Spirit says, I'm coming to redeem you, my blessed bride, the bride of Christ. And he's a given, the Holy Spirit is given as a pledge uh, for our inheritance. Because you know what we, we're going to do is one day we're going to own everything. Uh, you know, it's all ours because we're kids. We're heirs to the promises of God and all that he has to the view of the redemption of God's own possession. That word redemption, you know, you guys are too young to know, but before we are... Uh, at the, the, the supermarkets used to give out these trading stamps and you glue the trading stamps into little books. Then you go to the redemption center and you turn in that, that book and say, oh man, I, 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 I want that fishing reel that's in the case. And I'm redeeming my stamps for whatever you know, I pick because you know, 
uh, here it is, I got all these stamps, here's the redemption center. Now God is one day going to come back and say that, hey, these guys are marked, they're sealed, they have the pledge of the Holy Spirit, and now I'm coming back to redeem them for all eternity. And here in that, guys, uh, they, people say that you never hear what's the Trinity, you never see that in the Bible. But we see it clearly laid out right here, uh, chosen by the Father, redeemed by the Son, sealed by the Spirit. The threefold action of the triune God, you might describe it as a compound unity, four fingers and a thumb make one fist, well, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit make uh, our, our Heavenly uh, Father, our Heavenly God, to the redemption of God's own uh, possession, to the praise of His glory. Three times we've seen this term, to the praise of the glory of His grace. It's a reminder that we, uh, we have all that we need. We have all the help available. We have all the resources uh, needed for living on this plane, here on this earth, guys. So the, the, I remember the, the, the reminder was, don't live as spiritual offers, but draw on all the goodness, all the grace, all the mercy, all the strength, all the wisdom that God has for us. Amen. You know, you guys know about that. Sometimes you gotta pray, Lord, I need grace upon grace because I'm just going to I'm in my wits that the enemy's hammering me. I need this, I need that, Lord. But really what it is, is Lord, I need you. Let's pray. Father God, we do want to thank you for this morning, Lord. What a great, rich book this little book uh, of Ephesians is, Lord. And as we get into this book, as we get into the prison epistles in the coming weeks and months, Lord, as we look at the, the scene of what was going on uh, here in Ephesus, Lord, we can see that the, the church lived in a pretty debauched world, Lord. And there were a lot of pagan gods and pagan deities and a lot of idols. And, you know, it sounds just like... Uh, uh, it sounds like the modern world today. When you think of the bread and the circus in Rome, Lord, uh, give them, give them bread, give them beer, give them entertainment, Lord. It sounds like uh, much like uh, Friday night uh, high school, Saturday night college, uh, Sunday pro football, Monday pro, and this and that. We we get the entertainment, we get the full bellies, and a little bit of uh, the brew in us, and everything is good. And, you know, the, the enemy loves that. He just controls the people. That's what they did with the slaves back then in Rome, Lord. They used that as a, a way to control the masses, Lord. And, uh, uh, we thank you that your, your Bible reveals all to us, Lord, yeah. what's coming down, what's going on in this world. And we can kind of see uh, the play of the enemy, Lord, as he moves uh, uh, against so many people, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that this morning, I think that the well, majority of us here are all believers, Lord, seeking you first in your kingdom and your righteousness, Lord, trusting that you're going to add all things to us, Lord. So we pray, Lord, that as uh, Paul was encouraging, hey, don't live as a as a pauper, but, uh, but know all the riches that are available in Christ Jesus for us, to the praise of the glory of His grace. For it's in, in His name we 